Uh, we're on page uh, 152. I do recommend that you follow along uh, as we go. Um, and I am using some of the uh, examples from the book as well. All right, entering foreign markets. So first, remember this is, a, we talked about this before, the liability of foreignness, right? So there's an inherent disadvantage faced by foreign firms in host countries because of their non-native status. Um, the last time we talked about this, I reminded you that because we're in an election cycle, remember this is where Honda and Toyota, they have all these ads in The Economist magazine and Financial Times where they're just reminding people that uh, they have factories in the US and have cars made by Americans. And so they do this because they wanna remind everyone, we're here, we're creating jobs, we pay taxes. Uh, because around election time, uh, every four years, uh, candidates of both sides will, uh, you know, get the, the, um, the message out that, you know, we need to buy American, we need to support American companies, which, which is all great. Uh, the problem is that a lot of people uh, just go by their perception. And I know we talked about this before, and they don't realize that the Toyota Camry uh, is made in America, for example, or uh, the Civic or whatever. Uh, and some, uh, famously, some of the, in fact, a lot of the Dodge uh, pickup trucks, right? The Ram pickup trucks, those motors are almost entirely made in Mexico. Uh, and, and also Dodge has lots of factories in Canada. So, so anyway, it, things get confusing. It's globalization, right? Uh, and so there is that liability of foreignness that pops in. It's manifested in two ways, the differences in formal and informal institution governed by the rules of the game in different countries. So again, now what we're doing is we're expanding a little bit on that. And discrimination of foreign firms that I just touched on. Um, how do you overcome it? Well, okay, let's go over again the both views that we always talk about for every chapter. Firms need to take active, uh, sorry, action deemed legitimate by the various formal and informal institution and the foreign firms uh, need to increase resources to balance the liability and maintain a competitive edge. It's always a little bit of a balance. And this is where, remember, they also, uh, we, we had talked about before you enter, uh, knowing what the market looks like, uh, using these think tanks we talked about, like control risks, et cetera. Um, so again, this is what it looks like for the foreign market. Where do I go? When, where do I enter? Uh, when do I do it and how do I go about it? This chapter gives you a lot of the answers on how I go about it. And so for institution-based view, what are the regulatory risks, the trade investment barriers, different cultures, norms, and values? For the VRI, for the resource-based, it's always about the VRIO, right? Um, what are you doing to differentiate yourself, uh, it, among other things? All right, the location specific. So now we're getting into the benefits of a firm, reaps some features specific to a place, right? So that's where we talk about why would you go to some countries and not others? And maybe, uh, again, we'll talk about the first mover advantage. Maybe is it worth, what's the cost benefit of being the first to market in a country that might be a little bit more difficult if it means you're the first one there. Agglomeration, I know this is review. I know we've talked about it before. For agglomeration, we, uh, we, we always use the example of Silicon Valley. Um, in this case, I'll follow the example from your author, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, let's see, so agglomeration, again, our definition, uh, location-specific advantage that occur when there's a number of economic activities in a particular location. And it's important to match your firm's strategic goal to potential location. Um, it, it, you know, you, you want to make sure that there's a real reason why you're there. Um, there's, uh, you, maybe you've heard the term empire building. Empire building is when these big corporations uh, decide like we're just need to expand at any cost so we'll go everywhere. And so that, that can be a mistake, right? You still want to be very strategic about it. Uh, the opening case in your book on page 153 talks about Coca-Cola in Africa. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's smart strategy, Coca-Cola. Uh, sees Africa as, as opportunity. It's always had a, a foothold there, but now it's, it's really getting a little bit, uh, uh, you know, um, it, it's investing a little bit uh, in, in terms of equity versus non-equity. You're seeing more equity investments. 
um, the reason that Coca-Cola is doing this is, you know, kind of bittersweet. Uh, and the reason is it's doing this is because, of course, it's losing market share in the United States, even in Europe. Uh, and so it has to like try to offset those market share. So as developed countries are getting a little bit um, more educated about not drinking so much soda, um, you know, in this case, Coca-Cola is taking advantage of that demand in Africa. And so this is where ethics come in, right? Uh, let's see. Um, strategic goals. So you, you have also the nature uh, resource, natural resource seeking. Uh, use specific location where they find specific resources and the market seeking. Uh, I know, again, we've talked about this before uh, during the last recession, what really helped General Motors the most uh, to pay off its loan faster uh, from uh, the, you know, the federal government was uh, the demand in China. See, General Motors expects sales growth in China in 2016. Uh, Buick was one of the best selling brands in China. In fact, uh, here, I'll play this for you. This is a Buick ad. Um, let's see, here we go. This is a 2017 Buick ad, by the way, in China. There we go. <clears throat> so again, market seeking, right? How General Motors, I remember that uh, in 2010, there were more cars sold in China than in the US. This is from your author on page 137. So it's, uh, it was very, very smart for General Motors uh, to, to take that approach. Unfortunately, uh, it's, uh, it hasn't, um, GM has uh, gotten a little bit comfortable and uh, it really hasn't uh, done too much in terms of trying to uh, keep its brand fresh, try to keep it uh, uh, aligned with the demand of the market in China. And so it's retrenching. In fact, there's talk of even Buick uh, rebranding itself in China. Uh, let's see, strategic goals. So efficiency seeking, you can tell I've added a couple of things here. Uh, firms single out the most effective location featuring combination of scale economies and low cost factors. Um, and then of course, innovation seeking countries and regions renowned for generating world-class innovation. In this case, I use the example of Foxconn because it meets both of these definitions actually, right? And so here we have, I, I took this from Wikipedia on the right, Foxconn is the world's largest uh, provider of electronic manufacturing service and the third largest infotech company by revenue. It's the largest private employer in Taiwan and one of the largest employers worldwide. Its founder and chairman is Terry Gao. Uh, there at Foxconn or at Foxconn factory is where they make the Blackberry, the iPad, the iPhone, iPod, the Kindle, the Nintendo. Anyway, I don't have to read the whole thing. You can see it there. Uh, Foxconn factories manufactured 40% of all consumer electronics sold worldwide. So obviously several things are going on. Number one, of course, you're getting the efficiency seeking uh, because of the scale. And remember, we talk about global scalability. Nobody up to date has been able to do what Foxconn has been able to do, but also the innovation seeking. Remember that Foxconn is a partner with Apple. And so it, as, as, as much as you might think about this brilliant um, invention at Apple that you've made with your new fancy gadget, uh, that's good for you, but somebody needs to make the thing. And, and this is where uh, Foxconn has been able to, to really meet with its demand in terms of its partners by creating ways of making these products not in the best conditions always, by the way. Uh, there's tons of, I, I, need to, I need to mention this because I wanna make sure I do, um, there were lots of reports out there of um, very poor conditions in uh, Foxconn factories. Uh, in fact, uh, if you remember, I think in class, we talked about the suicide nets, right? In China, how um, they had to put these nets out because employees were, were committing suicide. 
how do you match your goal with your location? Okay, so here we just talked about the strategic goal and then what that means in terms of translating into the location specific advantages and the examples in the text. So again, I think I, I, I mentioned these, I think I'll let you guys do that on your own. And also this is all on page 156. Cultural distance, now it gets interesting. Again, we, we go back, this is review for a lot of us. If you, if you think about it, we go back to some of the stuff we've talked about uh, when we talked about, um, you know, uh, Gert Hofstede, uh, cultural distance is one of them, the difference between two cultures along identifiable dimension. Historically, I think we talked about this, uh, historically, uh, the United States number one trade partner has been Canada, not Mexico. And, um, and, and, and a lot of people would say that culture has a lot to do with it. We don't have to, uh, you know, if you, and you get, I say historically, go back over a hundred years, you know, you don't have to speak their language, you know, so we use English. Uh, even the currency makes it easy. We, we use the American dollar, they have the Canadian dollar. And the way that you do business is very similar. So when you look at the cultural dimensions of Kurt Hofstad, Canada is very, very well aligned with the United States. So there's kind of a natural uh, way to, to want to do business with another country that, that does business similar to you. So that's very little cultural distance. Mexico, where demand might even be greater. I mean, there is more greater population in Mexico. Uh, and so Mexico, then yes. And so there's some businesses in the US where maybe it's a small business and they are thinking about exporting, but they don't speak Spanish. And it seems like so complicated that they don't want to bother. And so that's where the, the cultural distance is greater. And so there's been a natural tendency throughout the world for countries to want to do business with neighbors uh, that are more like uh, them than other neighbors, right? Uh, if you look at ASEAN, a lot of the countries in ASEAN that were trading together going back hundreds of years, uh, you know, if you look at uh, Thailand and, uh, and Laos and Vietnam in that little area, obviously geographic area as well, but there's a lot of cultural similarities, right? Individualism, uh, you know, versus collectivism, I think we've talked about that. Institutional distance, again, now we're talking about the extent or similarity or dissimilarity between regulatory, normative, and cognitive institutions. Basically, the laws, you know, are you doing business the same as we're doing business or differently? If you remember uh, in your text, when you think about um, openness to business, right? And if you think about the, remember we talked about the Economic Freedom Index. And if you remember, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, uh, those countries have the highest economic freedom index in the world. Um, and what that does is it's opened up the market to everybody, right? Regardless of cultural distance. Why? Because in this case, especially developed countries, uh, you have similar institutional uh, setups, right? And so it's it's made it, it's, it's, it's allowed those economies to have a greater uh, um, uh, GDP. Uh, certain Western cosmetic, this is an example of great uh, institutional distance uh, in cultural distance. Uh, Western cosmetic firms find it difficult to expand their business in Saudi Arabia due to cultural distance. All right, so uh, how do you overcome it? Uh, you enter culturally similar countries. So this is during the first stage, right? So, um, and this might explain why when you look at the example of Coca-Cola, even though it's tried Africa for many years, but uh, um, you know, I remember, I, I, I believe it was uh, Swaziland that it had a factory there for a while back in the late nineties. Um, but it's, it's resisted uh, going to such, to, to the current, to the extent that it's going currently. And so if you think about um, how you go into a country, the first stage is, um, to uh, go into culturally similar countries. You gain more confidence to enter culturally distanced countries in later stages. Uh, strategic goals are more important than culture and institution. It's really important to remember that. You're going into these countries, uh, not just because you wanna expand, but because strategically, that's where the growth is, that's what matters to you, that's what makes sense. Uh, I like the example from your author on first mover advantage. Uh, so this is uh, a company uh, in Denmark called Vestas. It is on page 157. 
and it's really cool. It's uh, it's uh, you know renewable, so it's wind turbines, and and you learn a couple things. You learn from this little vignette. I really want all the guys to read it. It's very interesting. Uh, that several things actually apply to this company in terms of terminology from uh, this chapter. Uh, the first one is the first mover advantage, right? Um, and so, yes, it's a benefit that accrues to a firm that enters the market first and that later entrants do not enjoy. And so very much Vestas, uh, this Danish company, is one of the uh, first mover in terms of uh, scale and production of wind turbines. It's the biggest in the world now. What you find out is uh, on page uh, 157, you will see the map of uh, Denmark over here. And you will, that's when you, you, you see all of this competition now, all of these other competitors have come there for their wind turbines to make them. And so Vestas has competition in its own home turf. Um, and so uh, you have Envision Energy, you have Siemens Wind Power, and uh, you know, a bunch of um, you know, uh, corporations from different parts of the world. So what I did here is, let's see if this works, I wanted to show you a couple clips to illustrate uh, those examples here. So I'll bring them here. So the first one is just a, a corporate video to kind of give you a little bit, um, you know, of an example. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we lost, there we go. Um, this is the generic corporate stuff. The wind has always been shaping the landscape, moving people and their minds. At Vestas, wind means the world to us. It's all we do, and why we know wind better than anyone. Our knowledge and commitment to wind make us who we are the leader and pioneer of the wind energy industry. But we're in a race and need to be even better. A race to provide energy in the most profitable and sustainable way. We want to win this race. It will take hard work and dedication, and we will face resistance and rough patches, but we have never and will never quit, because we are Vestas. Together, we've achieved great results across the globe. We can proudly claim to have installed more turbines than anyone else, and that we monitor and service more turbines than anyone else. But we strive for even more, and we'll find the answers today for the questions of tomorrow. To the benefit of our customers and our planet. That's what a true leader does. So that's just to kind of, again, what we're talking about here is uh, scale. So it's the biggest, et cetera. But then uh, let's do, um, let's do this one. The Altafila project is the first utility-scale wind power plant in Jordan. It's a major step forward in terms of clean energy development, energy source sufficiency, and the security of supply for the country. When fully operational, the wind power plant will produce approximately 400 gigawatts of electricity annually, providing clean electricity for more than 150,000 Jordanians. This corresponds to an increase of 3% in Jordan's total power capacity. The Altafila wind farm will displace 235,000 tons of CO2 emissions per year. Vestas was awarded the full EPC contract for 38 V112 3-megawatt wind turbines. 
with its mere size, 117 megawatts in total, and its complex desert-like terrain in an altitude of 1,600 meters, it's a true landmark project for the region. And it's a testament to the value of true partnership between local and global players. The Altafila projects leverage fully from the global manufacturing footprint of Vestas. Blades were shipped from the US, Germany and Italy, towers from Spain, control systems from China and nacelles from Denmark. It took seven vessels to transport all main components to the port of Aqaba, two hours drive from Tafila. The limited port capacity required close cooperation with local authorities. A fleet of 12 special transport trailers and trucks managed inland transportation to the site over a period of seven months. At the site, more than 28 kilometers of road was constructed. 38,400 square meters of foundation were cast and a total of 161 kilometers of cables were laid, an accomplishment only possible with the support of local suppliers and partners. Within a period of approximately five months and one full month ahead of time, the experienced crane and installation teams finished the assembly and installation of the turbines. A testament to not only the hard work of the dedicated teams, but also to a fair amount of ingenuity in regards to lifting procedures and unloading, all of which were carried out in compliance with the specially developed health and safety plans for the site. Vestas draws from global experience in local markets. At Vestas, we have the track record, the technology, the global footprint and the local partnerships to effectively execute extraordinary projects anywhere. Throughout our almost 40-year history, we have delivered wind energy solutions in 74 markets and among these, we were the first to install a utility scale turbine in 35 countries. That's why we say that at Vestas, wind means the world to us. There you go. So, um, I mean, it's fascinating, right? So, again, I wanted to illustrate, since it was a, it was a really um, nice new, uh, uh, new, well, not new, but a different example for, for us than the ones that I've always used in class, uh, I thought I wanted to highlight that. It's a, it's a really fascinating one. And again, it meets uh, several tenets in terms of what... Uh, what this chapter does. Uh, and so, yes, in Jordan, for example, it does have that first mover advantage, right? And we noticed they were talking about 3% uh, uh, of the power comes from wind. And so what ends up happening is then uh, it starts to, you, you know, you see the cost benefit. Once those things are done, that's it. You just pay for the maintenance. And so it's gonna be a lot cheaper than, than other things, right? Although right now, um, if they're using oil, oil is cheap temporarily. The late mover advantage, what happens here is you decide I'm not going to risk it. I don't want to be the first one. Maybe, you know, maybe I was approached uh, by Jordan to uh, give a quote for wind turbine. But because of the uh, very high barriers in terms of uh, logistics, right? I mean, you, you saw everything they had to do. They, they didn't just come in and, and, and install these things. They had to actually help with infrastructure. They helped build roads, highways put down the, the cables for, for the power to get there. There's a lot of work, right? And so some other companies might have thought, I don't know. I don't know if I want to do all this. I think I might be better. Just let's just wait and see. And, um, and then you, you, you decide, okay, now that these guys have done it and that I know it's doable. And I know that the, 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 the Jordanian government has been great at complying and making sure the port authorities and everybody is just in on it. Uh, then, then, you know, I'll be happy to build uh, some uh, wind turbine uh, farms for you. So that would be the late mover advantage, right? Um, the first mover and late mover has pros and cons, right? So when you look at the examples of the first mover, you know, uh, you, there's lots of things that make it smart, right? Uh, it's high risk, high reward. Uh, why high risk? Well, let's look at the late mover advantage, right? Uh, the opportunity free uh, ride on first mover investment. 
they've kind of cleared the path for you. The first mover came in. If there were mistakes made, it was on them. If money was lost, it was on them. So you get to you know, benefit from that. Again, resolution of technological and market uncertainties. If you look at the example we just did in Jordan, uh, then you, you, you would think about uh, uh, putting the cables down and building roads and things. And uh, the first mover's difficulty to adapt to market change. Maybe uh, there were things that uh, they realized hindsight uh, that they didn't do optimally. And now uh, the second one can, can do that. And a lot of times you kind of set in their way. So the first mover might be less likely to do that. Okay, scale. So this is where you basically decide uh, to what extent do we want to go in? How much skin in the game? I know it's a term that, you know, it's, it's, it's investment in real estate investment. It's a term that's used all the time. Uh, if you think about someone who buys a house and they don't have a lot of money and they want to finance the whole thing, 100%, right? And uh, some, you know, lose their jobs and or something happens and they're thinking, ah, and they decide I'm just going to walk away from the house. If the question goes like this, if they had put 20% down on a $500,000 home or even 5%, are they more likely to walk away from the house or less likely to walk away from the house? So that's the idea of putting skin in the game, right? This is a little bit similar um, where if you are worried that um, the conditions might, might be hostile or change or some new uh, political party takes over uh, leadership in that country and, and really starts to turn on foreign direct investment, which, which happens, right? Uh, I think in the class we talked a lot about Argentina and, you know, different uh, parts of Argentina's leadership uh, for a while, uh, Kirshner, uh, the leader of Argentina, uh, was really uh, nationalizing some of the stuff, right? And so that, of course, is going to really just stop your FDI big time. So, so the scale of entry is going to help dictate to what extent you have confidence in the country. Uh, and so if you decide to come in with a green field, for example, that's a lot of confidence. On the other hand, if you just want to have even just export for a while, or if you're just going to have a, an agent locally do the work for you, that's definitely, you know, uh, low end. Uh, joint ventures are interesting. We'll talk about joint ventures uh, in terms of scale. So amount of resources committed to entering the foreign market. There's a large scale entry. Again, that's skin in the game, right? Shows strategic commitment to st certain markets, assures local customer and suppliers in the long run, and deter potential entrance. So again, it's the first mover advantage, right? If you're able to come in with a large scale uh, project, uh, then because of also the connections and the deals you're making, and you are the one who took a risk and the government, like kind of, they tend to reward you by sometimes making it a little bit more challenging for your competitors to come in, right? There, there's a lot, sometimes that's, that's going to happen. Um, and, uh, and also because it also maybe you've just cornered the market. You came in pretty strong and you have your greenfield operations going. And, you know, people may, may just might think like, I don't, there's, for now, there's not room for two. Uh, the problem is if you go uh, and you decide that you come in, uh, in, in terms of equity with high equity investment. So again, I use the example of Greenfield, then it's, it is hard to reverse that strategic commitment, right? What do you do that? You build a factory there. Um, it's got limited strategic flexibility. The huge losses can occur if the large scale bets are wrong. And by that, again, you know, how can they be wrong? Well, all it takes is a party leadership change in any country, that's it. Where you had one party that was favorable to you coming in and building the thing and the other party says, no, you know, we're gonna, this belongs to us and kick you out, nationalize it. That's, those are the big losses. Remember with Venezuela, we talked about all these lawsuits. I think Exxon was one of them. I mean, it's, you know, it lost everything. I don't know, uh, in fact, if Venezuela ever paid Exxon, but when uh, parts of Exxon's operation were nationalized in Venezuela, it was a huge loss. And the small scale entries, okay, so they're less expensive and they limit the downside risk. They focus on organization learning. You kind of get a feel around for uh, your market, uh, the infrastructure, um, you know, the support or lack thereof. It lacks commitment necessary to build market share and capture first mover advantage. 
Um, the methods used to enter foreign markets could be non-equity or equity. So again, non-equity, no skin in the game. If, that's, if that helps you at all, non-equity, no skin in the game. This is a lot of time just contractual. As we have to agree and partnership or something. So non-equity mode of entering the FARC through export or contractual agreement. There you go. Uh, they tend to reflect smaller commitment to overseas market and they include export and contracts. Uh, and so the equity mode is the one where now you're putting skin in the game. And so it could be uh, uh, joint ventures or a wholly owned subsidiary, right? Indicates a relatively larger, hard to reverse commitment, calls for the establishment of independent organizations overseas. Uh, and so here it is. Now, if, um, if, if we hadn't, of course, the whole, you know, uh, pandemic being what it is, if, uh, if we had been able to, to uh, uh, and I don't want to blame it all on the pandemic, I know that we were, sometimes we had some great discussions in class that put us behind, but if we had not been behind, what's special about this uh, chart that you're looking at here is that that actually uh, piggybacks into the next chapter, right? So which we'll not see this semester, uh, but, but chapter 10 and 11 kind of go hand in hand. And there's a lot of that that shows up again on the next chapter where you have to kind of uh, create a matrix and use the mode of entry as part of the matrix in terms of form and function, right? What your strategy is and based on your strategy, what's the best format? So what you do here is the best thing is just again to kind of split everything in half. Your choice of entry is page 161, by the way, is where the chart is. And you can go equity or non-equity, very simple. However, what's interesting is that strategic alliances, you see right there, this, this kind of square that's drawn out, uh, strategic alliances can be equity strategic, alli strategic alliances or non-equity strategic alliances. So if you decided to go in non-equity, but kind of open up some doors and show a little bit commit more commitment toward the future, more equity-based, then you might decide non-equity, but with a strategic alliance, if that makes sense. Because those strategic alliances, when they go well, they could turn into a joint venture, right? But again, this is good for you because it's a kind of a really good review that a joint venture is equity-based, right? Uh, that's why I brought them up earlier. Uh, licensing and franchising is a contract. A turnkey project is a contract. Uh, R&D, co-marketing, all of these are just contracts. In terms of equity, joint venture, both of you are creating sometimes a third company, right? Just remember that company A gets together with company B and together they create company C. Right. Uh, when you have uh, strategic alliances, you remember that company A stays company A, company B stays company B, and they work on the same project as company A and company B. Whereas with a joint venture, you're talking often about two companies creating a third. And then you could decide with the, you know, you could be a minority or a majority or 50-50 joint venture. That's kind of like how the math is done here. Um, and so that's for equity. The weakest uh, level of entry, of course, is the non-equity, uh, non-equity, non-strategic alliance model, right? So you're talking about just exporting. It could be direct export. That's it's a no-brainer. You're just going to export from A to B, or it could be indirect, uh, where you remember you're, you're dealing with a company. You have a third-party company that does the work for you. You have your product. You ship it to them. And they could be domestic, and then that domestic company is uh, an expert at helping you export throughout the world. You pay a fee and you have very little, you have no control. Um, or maybe some other level of export. There's like a little complicated types out there. Well, not that complicated. If you want to go like full speed ahead and you want to go all in and big large scale projects that are FDI equity based, this is where you have these wholly owned subsidiary. And I talked a lot about the green fields. I mean, the green fields are probably, Again, of all of the levels, those are the ones that show the most commitment, right? I'm going to agree to go in your country and I'm going to build a factory there from scratch, right? I might even agree to do some kind of work in terms of infrastructure. I'm going to put down some rails 
for the trains to get to the factory. I'm going to put down some roads, uh, fiber optic networks, whatever. I agree to all these terms. Sometimes it's ports. Maybe there's a port and that port doesn't have infrastructure to the area that I want to build or that you agreed to have me build. And so I'm going to maybe go 50-50 with you, or maybe I'll go 75-25 with you so that uh, we can build a road, a highway from the port to this area. So this is pretty, pretty hardcore. Uh, China, with the Belt and Road Initiative, is doing tons of those projects, by the way. Um, all right, so now, now that we've kind of, I've highlighted this thing graphically, what we have next is just, again, now the author explaining everything from left to right. So, you know, I don't think I need to go into a lot of uh, detail here. The direct export, we know what that is. You capitalize on scalability for production that, that's in your country. Remember that if I'm really good at manufacturing this thing in my country, and then um, I decide to manufacture another one in your country, that's duplication, isn't it? And now all of a sudden I have to ask myself, hmm, is this smart to replicate everything to do it twice? So sometimes the way that it works, if you look at Mercedes-Benz making cars in the United States, what kind of cars does it make in the US? Well, the cars that Americans buy, right? SUVs, for example, not that big. The SUVs don't do really well in Germany or in Europe. Why? Because of the fuel tax over there, right? It's just ridiculous. Plus, you have to pay a guzzler tax. That's also insane. That's why when you go to Europe, you barely see any SUVs. You see tiny little cars because of the cost of fuel. And so maybe when you do the, you know, the direct export, it might make sense for you uh, in terms of scalability, you're keeping it in-house because uh, there's no, you know, maybe the market is not differentiated from what you make. And there's no need for you to make another factory over there and replicate everything. Maybe right now it works, right? As long as costs in terms of currency, distribution, everything. Indirect export, again, it's through an intermediary. I don't think I need to go into a lot of details. Licensing franchising, I know we talked about that in class before. I think the example that I used for a licensing franchising agreement was uh, Pizza Hut in Thailand. I'm sure you all remember that example. It didn't end well. Turnkey project, you pay a contractor to design, construct new facility and train the personnel. I have some cool examples of that coming up. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're just, uh, you're coming in, maybe you've decided you're, you're, there's a product, uh, you're good at helping create something, a stadium or something. And so it's gonna be a turnkey project. Co-marketing, uh, again, together joint uh, to market their product and services. That's co-marketing. I know we use a lot of examples in class of co-marketing. Nike, uh, well, maybe not Nike. Well, look at your laptop right now that you have or desktop, and you'll see co-marketing. I have a Dell, and on, on, on the cover of, of, of my keyboard area there, there's a little sticker that says Intel. That's co-marketing, right? And a lot of times when you see an ad for a Dell, uh, it'll say Intel inside as co-marketing. All right. So uh, there we go, the bot agreements. So those are pretty cool, the build, operate, transfer. Uh, and so it involves building and operating a facility for a period of time before transferring operations to a domestic agency or a firm. I'm going to apologize in advance. This is my class. I get to decide what I want to do in terms of examples. And this is one of my favorite stories. And it's old, it's from the 60s, but dang it, it's fascinating. I want you to just kind of see it this way. All right, let's pretend that Kim Jong-un approaches, I don't know, Ford and says to Ford, hey, we want cars. We suck at making cars. We just, you know, I mean, I don't think North Korea has even tried making cars, right? But let's pretend they did and uh, they just don't, they don't have it. You know, cars are horrible. In fact, uh, there's a term, it's called uh, negative value, right? Negative value is uh, when you, uh, the steel that you bought to make the car uh, is worth more as steel than it is uh, in the form of the uh, chassis of the car because the car is just such crap quality. So, um, you know, think about how crazy and how insane that example sounds like, right? If uh, Kim Jong-un approached Ford, and let's pretend Ford was like, okay, so here's what we'll do. We'll go to North Korea. 
we'll bring all of our expertise. We're going to build a factory for you that's very similar to the factories we have in the US. We're going to teach you how to make a Ford. Let's pretend it's, I don't know, uh, what Ford sells anymore. Uh, let's just, just pretend it's uh, the Ford Explorer. And so we're going to help you make Ford Explorers in North Korea. But by the way, I understand it's a little bit embarrassing for you. You don't want to call it a Ford Explorer. So what do you want to call it? OK, you're going to call it the, I don't know, Moonshine Ford. No, Moonshine something. You're going to call it the Great Kim Car. And, um, and so I'm going to teach you everything. I'm going to be there for a while. And after a couple of years, I'm going to just walk away. And you've paid me a lot of money. And, uh, and you're going to make those cars. And so, and you're going to badge them, brand them however you want. And by the way, everybody who knows anything about cars will realize these are the same cars, right? So imagine that example. And if it sounds absurd to you, then you'll understand why I'm using an example from the 60s, because that's exactly what happened between the Soviet Union, when it was still the Soviet Union, and Fiat of Italy, right? So, um, Let's see, it's used to establish a longer term presence. And um, I'll give you an example in the next slide about that. R&D, outsourcing agreement and R&D between firms. So that happens a lot uh, between different firms. So this is really cool. Excuse me, I think it's cool. So this is uh, an actual uh, joint committee print, right? On, uh, and it's from 1979. And it's from the Joint Economic Committee Congress of the United States. Uh, and it's on issues in East-West commercial relations. East-West meaning communist regimes versus the United States. Like, can we, can we actually make some money, you know, from, from these countries? And if you look at uh, the little excerpt that I took here, uh, it's about the Volga auto plant in uh, Toliati, right? So within four months after a speech, whatever, the Soviet government signed a protocol for scientific and technical cooperation with FIAT. This type of agreement was unusual in 65, but has since become commonly used Soviet device for initiating long-term contacts with Western uh, firms. The protocol led to discussion between Fiat and Soviet officials that cul culminated in the signing of a contract in 66, providing for Fiat assistance in the construction of a massive new passenger car factory in Toliati. Under the contract, Fiat agreed to provide designs for a factory to produce 600,000 passenger cars, included contracts where the license to manufacture the vehicles in the Soviet Union. So this, this is actually a little bit more involved than what we're doing now because it's also a licensing agreement. So it's, it's got a little bit uh, different facets. Uh, rumor was that Fiat never got paid, by the way. Uh, let's see. Uh, the agreement foresaw production of the first auto in 69 attainment of capacity production in 72. And this ambitious schedule was not met because of a variety of problems, not unlike those that had been experienced by the uh, Gorky plant in the 30s. Once again, major problem was deficiencies, quantitative and qualitative in the Soviet supply system. The first cars were produced one year behind schedule and full production capacity had been revised upward to 660,000 was attained in 74. Um, and so, the LADA, L-A-D-A, by the way. So there were, there were different names for this plant, but um, Atovaz uh, was the name of the plant that made LADA, right? And that was basically the Fiat plant in the Soviet Union. I mean, that's just crazy. History is pretty cool sometimes. So what I did here is I wanted to show you exactly what they look like. So on the top, you have the 1970 Fiat 124, which was a really back then a, a, a very strong seller. It was a cheap car. I mean, look look how it was designed, right? It looks very basic style and it kind of worked. Quality, not good. In fact, that's why you don't see too many around anymore. Uh, you know, you see a lot of Toyotas from the 70s, tons, but in Europe, you see very few of these bad boys because they were just dodgy on the quality. Uh, and then at the bottom, you have the, the Lada or the Vaz, like the short for Auto Vaz, uh, 2101, uh, which is the same. That's when that one came out, right? And they're very, very similar. Uh, one has the little red Fiat logo on it. And the other one, of course, has a red boat, uh, which is the Lada. The, it's named after a famous boat that has to do with 
Russian history. So anyway, I have the hyperlinks here if you're interested to kind of go back. Uh, kind of Wikipedia did a decent job explaining what, what happened there. Uh, and then what I did is I wanted to show you that fiat was pretty clever. Uh, fiat expanded, in fact, um, it throughout. In fact, let me just go back, make sure we're all, remember what we're talking about, we're talking about build, operate, transfer, right, bought agreements. And so what fiat in Italy, the fiat 124, just give you an example, here's actually a better picture of the Lada 2101 and, and the grill looks so, this is, this is the same car, right? And then over here, uh, Seat, you probably heard of Seat, it's pronounced Seat, spelled Seat. The Seat 124, they even called it the same name in Spain. So Fiat was Fiat in Italy, but they created Seat in uh, Spain. And just in case you were thinking like, wait, isn't, but were they the same company? They were not, they were not, this was a bot. And so today, uh, Fiat is still Fiat. Fiat owns a bunch of stuff. In fact, Fiat owns Chrysler. Uh, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, all that stuff. But, uh, and I think they still own Ferrari. Uh, yes, they, Ferrari and a bunch of other companies. Uh, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. But interestingly enough, the company, Seat is not wholly owned. Seat is owned by Volkswagen. I think we talked about that, right? And then of course, Lada is still sold in, you know, in fact, throughout Eastern uh, countries, you still see a bunch of Ladas, sometimes you'll see them in Europe, in Western Europe, not too many though. Uh, and it's, uh, as far as I'm, cause I, as I know, it's still Atovaz. All right, so the equity modes, the joint ventures, I talked about that. New corporate entity created and uh, owned by two or more parent companies. Uh, sometimes they call that uh, a corporate child. Remember I talked about that earlier. What, company A, company B get together and they come up with company C. That's why we call it a corporate child. They're not operating as company A and company B alone. Let's see if you remember what that is, right? It's a strategic alliance, a strategic agreement. Uh, the wholly owned subsidiaries, subsidiaries located in a foreign country that is entirely owned by the parent uh, multinational. Uh, I know we talked about a lot of those. And so again, a Greenfield is a wholly owned subsidiary, right? So when we talked about uh, Airbus, you know, opening up its uh, plant to make airplanes, in Alabama, that's an example of a green field. It could also be done by acquisition. A wholly owned could be, you have two choices. You could make one from scratch, very tough, but it's yours and you did it your way. That's a green field. Or maybe you decide I'm just gonna buy this plant over here and that's gonna be mine. You know, just put my name on there. Uh, you could buy it. Uh, modes of entry again. So in terms of the equity versus a non-equity, this gives you the pros and cons. I will let you guys uh, make sure that you understand the pros and cons and they might show up by the way. But all of these, you know, again, here's the example we talked about licensing and franchising Pizza Hut in Thailand. Uh, you know what happened there. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna let you guys make sure you kind of get the pros and cons out on your own. I need to take all the time to do that here. Uh, and I, I feel comfortable doing that by the way because I spent a lot of time going over definitions. So I think you'll recognize a lot of the pros and cons anyway. What are the implications for actions? Understand the rules of the game, both formal and informal rules of the game. So again, we're talking about number one, internally, your VRIO, right? Uh, making sure that you have all that locked in and that you understand that you, you know, probably the I being, you know, essential, right? If you don't get that, if you don't have a yes on the I for VRIO and you decide to go over there and do it, you're setting yourself up. Right? Maybe that's what, uh, if you think about Pizza Hut, maybe didn't really have that VRIO. Maybe it never did. And so, um, you know, made it just too easy for the pizza company to become the pizza company. So, again, make sure you have all of that internally. And again, for the external, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the uh, 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 um, formal, making sure that. Um, you do all your homework and you're, you're setting up. There's always gonna be uncontrollables out there, but that your position that's at least to hopefully not have to just react or uh, adapt, but take, take advantage of that. Develop overwhelming resources and capabilities to offset the liability of foreignness. So we talked about that as well. Match efforts in market entry with your own strategic goal. This is where I say, be careful of this whole uh, empire building uh, type of uh, syndrome. 
All right, so that's it for that. Uh, we finished chapter 10. Um, make sure you read, follow along with the book, people, and uh, use your flashcards. And uh, that's it for now.